I looked at the track list, I saw this song called Herzog, and immediately thought, who the hell writes a song about Whitey Herzog? We've been playing in bands together for 20 years. I could definitely tell it was a Viso Harrow or the core of a Viso Harrow. Recognizable Walter thing on the guitar. Pete Townsend kind of influenced. We were just unsignable or unplaceable as bands or their music, you know? It's just so kind of hard to call. I remember meeting Dave when he was in a band called Minister Thumb at a show at CBGB's. He had really long hair. That whole band was the bunch of hippies. I don't think you can talk about Aviso Hara or New Brunswick in the 90s or my role with Jersey Beat. We talk a little bit about WeFest, this crazy 24-7 indie rock uh, festival. And with this, I actually, the first interview I did with the reason I was in Wilmington, North Carolina at WeFest. It's an incredible bonding experience. And I really think the relationships that were formed from that, we brought back to New Jersey and it really changed how we interacted, how the bands interacted. Oh my goodness, there was the, uh, the fetish night with uh, Jay, the, uh, the first drummer. Not safe for work. The thing about the reason I, I always said had this palpable energy uh, verging on entropy, and I described it once as a train in an old movie whipping around the mountain, kind of coming halfway off the tracks, and you never knew if it would get to the bottom of the mountain or not, or it go completely flying off into oblivion. And it was that borderline chaos that gave Ovi Sahara its very special edge, and it's one of the things that I always really appreciated about the band. First time I met Dave was at a skin yard show at Maxwell's. That was in a band called Toe that we broke up, Mr. Thumb breaks up, and I think he was calling me to see if I had Tommy Southern's number from Godspeed. I was like, oh yeah, I'll play. <laughs> I think I just like talked myself into it. Brought in Ralph, who was the singer from Toe, and that became Aviso Hara. I thought Aviso Hara kind of had a, like a, a, a little edge to it, yet it didn't sound like a Jersey band, which to me was always like a nightmare. I would go out to New Jersey, go see some bands and either they sounded like Bon Jovi or they sounded like Bon Jovi with a flannel shirt you know, and, that was, and they couldn't tune their guitars so that, that made them grunge. I talked to them about bringing them into the city and doing some tracks at Hit Factory at the time uh, which was where I was based out of. Before there were websites and MySpace and internet and things like that so you couldn't really find out about a band unless you talked to them or saw them live. And the first sessions we had were in what would probably be one of the top five most expensive rooms in New York City at the time. Uh, we were on a console that was used by John Lennon it before he passed. I didn't know there were pictures of, you know, imitations of uh, John Lennon photos and, and Sean. Or even genitalia and consoles from what I heard. I wasn't in the room for that shit under control to a certain extent. And it sounds almost like the closest I would say to any band from that time will maybe influence with them is like who's good at But through all this work of like working up these songs and making these songs and then recording them and then just so we can like have a few beers and then just go on stage and play. <laughs> the phrase stoner pop came to mind when we were recording. I think we really finally found our footing. Mm.
we live in this post-strokes world and this is like pre-strokes music, you know, with like big guitars. I don't want to say emo because that took on a whole horrible other connotation. You're playing guitar another 16, 17 years, you, you get better. But the, the core is still there. Memories of, of the first wave of sort of post Aviso bands, including Slowwire and then Walter's band. Uh, you'd go to a show and then six months later you'd go to another show and it'd be almost a different band. I saw Eastern Anchors play once a couple years ago. They were opening for Doug Gillard from Guided by Voices. When I went to see them at practice before we did this record, that I felt like it was like a different band. Clydesdale was a band that Benny, who was a drummer in Abuse of Horror, was in with Ken. And then they were getting ready to do their second record and they asked me to record their demos. So I recorded their demos in a t-shirt factory. And one day they asked me to play guitar because Billy, who was the singer, wanted to just sing. And half the band decided to move to Portland. Okay. Half the band moves to Portland. Bad move. Well, that's what you do in New Jersey, right? You move to Portland. Yes. When, when things go awry here. Dave saw us play and then liked yeah. it. Yeah, like what you guys are doing. I said, oh, I want to play in that band. It pretty much went solid for a while and Dave had to leave. His new wife had another kid and he just didn't have the time. Our bass player left. Robbie, you know, we, Dave was the obvious choice to bring back in. Black Friday, the day after Thanksgiving, is, is, a, is a good day for us. It's a productive day. I <laughs> brought a bag of mixed beers and I brought my recorder and set up some mics. Uh, I think we did like seven like rough songs. Maybe only one of them made it to the record, but there were all these weird songs in, in this tuning. And at first I was thinking like, I don't know if this is gonna fly. No one really plays bass like they I think I, I sent him a, an email that was almost like, like trying to get back with a girlfriend. Like, <laughs> I know you're really busy. <laughs> yeah. It worked. But let me see. Let me throw <laughs> this out at you. And let me see what you said. Just because I have to work out the situation, you know, in my life. I'm like, all right, hey, honey, uh, Guess what? Ben wants me back. See you Thursday. <laughs> oh, when I write, I always have that Dave bass sound in my head. And when I try to ask, talk to other people to do it, it's like, you know, step on that pedal and and, like, and make do it. Some noise. I'm like, no, it doesn't sound right. You know? <laughs> Be louder. I don't know if it's the tuning or something, but it really is now a band that has like an actual like voice of its own. I can reference other bands when describing them and they, they really just do actually sound like themselves which is pretty unusual. They're not chasing a trend. It's, it might be a little bit more refined, a little more, a little slick. Could very well have had 15 albums by now. Basically, yeah. basically the Guided by Voices makes us look like teeny boppers. I would tell a Brooklyn hipster similar in some ways to the Killers if, they, if the Killers weren't fake. See, if I described it to a Brooklyn hipster and I was like, oh, they sound like Jawbox and Chavez, I'd be like, what the fuck is that? I'm 26. If I had to review it on Twitter, like they do with Spin nowadays, old guys regain form, uh, sonic goodies uh, for all. You're, you're missing out from like a whole evolutionary, you know, lineage that at the moment, you know, may not be like the thing. This is not like something out of out of space. This is music that means a lot to a lot of people. Go check it out. It's all I'm, done. All right. I'm, I'm Tom Bojour and I recorded the Eastern Anchors record here at my studio Nuthouse recording in Hoboken, New Jersey. And I'm Jewish. <laughs> you know how to find a blind guy in a nude beach? Not hard. Don't smoke pot. <laughs> don't do very. Don't rare. do acid. Don't do shrooms. We're almost like a straight edge band. We're on controlled diets. Controlled diets. <laughs> well, we're old now. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> straight edge with beer. Exactly. Yeah. yeah on certain days. <laughs> certain days. Sometimes you bring wine to practice. Yeah.